Good evening and welcome everyone. Um, I am Dinda Elliott. I'm the Director of Programs at China Institute. And we are so delighted to be bringing you this program tonight. Uh, we have hosted Cixin Liu three times at China Institute, whoops. Um, the first time was 2014 uh, when his book Three Body Problem was coming out. And the second time was 2018 um, at the time of the release of Ball Lightning. And well, the last time we hosted Cixin Liu at China Institute, there were practically people hanging from the rafters and the line for autographs for his book wound through the corridors. Um, I will say that I've never met a writer with such a passionate um, group of groupies. So it's very, very exciting to have um, Cixin Liu back again. Um, and uh, his books, you know, The Three Body Problem and Now Wandering Earth, of course, have captured huge audiences in China and taken the world by storm. So we have a star-studded cast of characters tonight. Not only do we have Cixin Liu, but we also have Michael Barry, who is a translator and author, a professor of contemporary Chinese cultural studies, and the director of the Center for Chinese Studies at UCLA. And he will be guiding our conversation tonight. Michael's translation of major Chinese works have won, won numerous awards, and he is also an expert on Chinese film. Uh, he wrote a book about the work of Jia Zhang Ke, who spoke here at China Institute just a few weeks ago. Our translator tonight, Eric Abrahamson, is one of the top literary translators in the, in the United States. He helps run Paper Republic, promoting the translation of Chinese literature into English. And he also works with the Seattle City of Literature organization. Uh, Eric spoke a few months ago at China Institute about the challenges of presenting Chinese works in translation to an American audience. Um, I also, before we get started, I wanted to thank our partners, Tor Books and the Strand Bookstore, and also for the, the Center for Fiction. Um, we're really delighted to be presenting this, uh, this program in partnership with them. We will try to take a few questions from the audience at the end, so please do type your questions into, you'll see the Q&A uh, icon at the bottom of your screen, so please type your questions into the chat box, the Q&A box. And um, without further ado, over to Michael. So Michael and Cixin and uh, Eric, come on to the screen, please. Thanks. Thank you, Dinda and China Institute. It's a great honor to be with everyone tonight and to host this event. Uh, when I was first invited, I was, it was really a true honor because uh, Liu Cixin is, like Dinda said, a real powerhouse over the last couple of decades. And so the format tonight is going to be a one-on-one -on -one dialogue. And then towards the end, we will be taking some of your questions. So if you do have questions at any time, please type them in the Q&A box and we'll try to squeeze in as many as we can. And without further ado, we are going to begin. So welcome, uh, Lil Usher, and we're so happy to have you. And my first- Hello. Hello. Hello, everyone. So my first question has to do with, usually when we think of science fiction in China, we always think of the three phases. Uh, the first phase being the late Qing dynasty, then during the early reform period in the late 70s, there was a burst of Chinese science fiction. And the third wave is today, and we're right in the middle of it. And I'm curious, what were the books that, uh, your, if you look at your history of coming of age, it really corresponds to that second age. And I'm wondering if indeed those were the books in the late 70s, early 80s, those early science fiction books coming out of China that really uh, grabbed your imagination. And what were you reading during your formative years? And so, uh, 第二个是改革开放初期就是变成一个科幻你吧 
那个阶段是新中国刚刚成立的那个上世纪五十年代那个阶段，那也是一个中国科幻小说比较繁荣的一个阶段。嗯、um, ，对。Uh, you're obviously very familiar with the uh, the history of science fiction and its development in China,、um, but I would say that you're missing one、uh, phase out of the three the three that you've enumerated here. There's one more,、uh, which is the early 1950s, right after the establishment of the new of of the new China.、Uh, that was another period of of science fiction development in China. 呃，其实我接触科幻小说不在这四个阶段中的任何一个。呃，我最初接触科幻小说是在这个文革时期，就是我的童年、少年、少年那那个时代。那个时候，中国完全没有科幻小说的出版，甚至也没有这个科学幻想的概念。Um, I would say that my first exposure to science fiction、uh, didn't happen necessarily in any one of these four periods that we're talking about here.、Uh, the first time that I came in contact with science fiction was during the Cultural Revolution,、uh, that is to say, during my own childhood,、uh, my own youth. And this was a time when science fiction was not being published within China at all. We really had no concept of what science fiction was. Uh, 我接触到的第一第一批。第一本科幻小说是那个凡尔纳的作品，呃，《地心游记》。I don't know which which the the first、uh, work of science fiction that I read was. 不好意思，是哪个国家的？呃，凡尔纳，儒勒·凡尔纳，法国的。Oh, Verne, Verne. Jules Verne.、Uh, Excuse me. 凡尔纳，对对，凡尔纳，对。Journey to the Center of the Earth. So the first, yes, the first book book of science fiction that I read was Jules Verne's Journey to the Center of the Earth. 呃，由于那个时候他完全没有这个科学幻想的概念，而这个凡尔纳、威尔纳，就他的这个呃写作的这个手法十分写实，他那个手法，呃，就是十像十八世纪探呃十九世纪十十八世十八世纪探险小说那种很写实的笔法，所以说我拿到这本书的时候，我不知道它是科幻小说，我以为他写的那些探险都是真实的，都是真事 Um, so at the time when I came into contact with this book, I really had no concept of science fiction as a genre, and Jules Verne's writing wasn't—it、uh, wasn't very science fictional. It wasn't very fantastic. It was very realist.、Uh, it read sort of like a 19th century、um, social novel or a, or a,、um, so、a mystery novel. And so when I read it, I didn't really realize that it was completely made up. I didn't realize it was science fiction. I sort of took it as a, a true account almost. 当我父亲告诉我这些都是科学幻想，都是想象出来的时候，我感觉到十分震惊。就是说，我对这个作家有这样的想象力，感觉到十分震惊。所以从那个以后，我大概就成了一个终身的这种科幻迷吧。Uh, later, my father told me that this wasn't a, this book wasn't real at all. It was completely made up,、uh, and it was a, it was fa- it was fantastical, and that there was such a thing as science fiction. And I was shocked、uh, to think that a writer could have such an incredible imagination.、Uh, I was I was really blown away by this book, and from that was the moment when I became a lifelong science fiction fan. 呃，这个时间大概是七十年代初的样子。呃，后来的中国改革开放以后，也就是七十年代末，呃，才有机会大量的接触到这个，呃，科幻小说。And that probably 接触到这个西方进入的翻译过来的科幻小说。That probably happened sometime in the early 70s,、uh, and it wasn't until later on during refer- reform and opening up after the end of the 70s that we started to see large amounts of、uh, science fiction being published in China. The majority of it, Western science fiction, that was being translated into Chinese. And you know, I'm, I'm curious. Besides literature, what are the other areas that inspire you? Because you've created such a rich universe, and I'm just wondering, where do you go for in- inspiration besides literature? Is it architecture, physics, music, films? Are there elements that you feel have a really profound impact on your body of work? 就是除了阅读之外呢，我这很好奇。您还是否受到其他媒介就是特别大的影响？比如说建筑，或者物理，或者音乐，或者电影，有有哪一些因素，就是在您的写作生涯当中一直扮演一个非常重要的一个影响？呃，我受到的影响主要主要来自于两个方面，呃，电影对我的影响很大，就是说我看的电影很多。
呃，另外一个影响就是，呃，俄罗斯的文学我看的很多，呃，我认为我除此之外受到的影响来自这两个方面。嗯 ，I'd say there's two main areas、uh, that have had a big effect on me. The the first is film. I've watched many many films.、Uh, I'm a film buff. Uh, and the other area is Russian literature, in particular.、Uh, so, apart from literature, it's coming from you know the so-called West,、uh, books from books from Russian writers. Because, like me, this age of Chinese people, or more or less, they will be affected by Russian literature. Writers of my generation,、um, we sort of couldn't help but be、uh, to, but be influenced to one extent or another by Russian writers and Russian Russian literature. 当然，对于一个科幻小说作家来说，我觉得我受到的最大的影响还是来自于这个科学和技术这些方面。嗯 ，Of course, as a writer of science fiction, I think that my biggest influence has come from the areas of actual science and technology themselves. 呃，我的思维其实不是一个文学作家的思维，而是一个工程师的思维。呃，也有一些这个科学的思维，但是。呃，我写作的时候并不是那种呃，就是说文学的思维，它主要的思维的主流是科学和技术来塑造的。My mode of thought isn't really a an author's mode of thought. My brain is not an author's brain. My brain is an engineer's brain.、Um, and when I'm writing, I'm thinking in terms of I'm thinking in terms of the science of the technology and of of the engineering mostly. 所以说，有些中国的这个评论家，文学评论家。看了我的书以后，就评论说这个人没有受过起码的文学训练。So there are critics inside China, literary critics in China,、um, who have read my works and and said this this author hasn't had even the most basic exposure or training、uh, to to literary works, literary writing. Thank you.、Uh, earlier, I mentioned these three phases, or if we take Lilasha's correction, the four phases of Chinese science fiction. Um, right now, we're certainly in the center of the storm in terms of the fourth wave. It's really taken the global literary imagination by storm, and you've been at the center of that with the three body problem. And I'm wondering if you could just talk about some of the factors that you think have contributed to the global popularity of science fiction today. I don't think anybody expected this. Those、uh, are. 前面讲到，呃，中国科幻小说的三个阶段，或者按你说四个阶段吧，呃，目前我们正在第四个阶段的高峰、高峰、高峰期吧。而且，因为这是您的《三体》带动的，就突突然间，我想很多人没有预料到，就是全世界都会迷上中国的科幻小说吧。呃，这是非常大的一个改变，就是很多年来，像习近平一直想把中国文学送出去。当初大概没有想到是通过科幻小说这样的一个渠道啊，把它送到全世界吧。您觉得有什么因素使得这么多这世界各地的读者都这么喜欢，就是迷上中国科幻小说？你觉得背后的形象会有什么样的一些因素吧？呃，首先，我觉得这是大时代的一个原因吧。呃，这个其实我们。观察一下科幻小说的这个历史，我们就会发现，呃，科幻小说这个文学题材，它有一个很有趣的一个特点，就是说，呃，它它是一个这个它它在标志着一个国家的发展状态。科幻小说。Um, I think this is sort of a result of the era that we find ourselves in globally. If you look at the、uh... The history of science fiction in various languages in various countries. You, you notice something interesting:、uh, the popularity of science fiction or the rise of science fiction is a certain、uh, certain marker of a country's development. 比如，在这个英国大英帝国处于巅峰时期的时候，科幻小说在英国诞生。呃，当英国衰落，美国开始崛起，开始快速发展的时候。科幻小说就转移到了美国，科幻小说的中心，呃，而且形成了科幻小说的第一个黄金时代。呃，那么现在中国的科幻小说开始受到注意，我想可能与这个中国快速发展与它的这种现代化的进程，呃，有着密不可分的关系。
Um, something we can notice is that the, uh, <clears throat> the beginning of science fiction in the UK followed the, the rise of the British Empire and sort of it, it held, had its peak at the same time that the British Empire was having its, the, at the height of its power. And later, as the British Empire began to collapse and the US rose to take its place, uh, the, the sort of global center of science fiction also followed that uh, to move to the United States. Uh, and, and that's where it had its sort of golden age uh, at that, in, that area of, in that era of US power and prosperity. Um, now people are paying attention to science fiction in China. And I think that's inextricably connected with the fact of China's development and its modernization and its place in the world now. 呃，作为一个中国人呢，我每天都在感到自己周围的世界在发生着快速的变化。我的童年时代，呃，少年时代和我现在生活的，呃，这个时代，其实简直它就是两个世界。用中国的话来说，叫恍若隔世，就两个世界。我想了一下，大概历史上很少有一代人在一生中能够经历我们这么大的生活的变化。所以说，现在中国是一个充满着未来感的一个国家，呃，这就给科幻小说的发展就提供了一个呃很肥沃的土壤吧。So I think this this has to do inevitably has something to do with the speed of China's development and change in our society. When I think of the the China that I lived in as a child and as a youth. Uh, and the China that I live in now, at the present, um, you could say that these are two completely separate worlds. These are worlds apart. These two, these two Chinas. Uh, and I think it's sort of rare in history that one generation would be able to uh, have that experience of living in two worlds in one lifetime. Uh, so I think that China, because of that, China's got is full of a sense of the future. Uh, it's looking towards the future, uh, and this is a this is a state that gives science fiction a. a, a Rich bed for development and、uh, and growth. My next question is about fan culture, which is something very unique to your work. Of course, there's a lot of Chinese writers that have robust fan communities. We think of Jin Yong and、uh, John Eiling and so many other writers.、Um, but I've never seen a group of fans, literary fans. With such a rabid、uh, thirst for your work, that have even created their own unique kind of online ecospheres and online communities,、uh, writing fan fiction,、uh, extending your work into their own imagination, fan clubs, cosplay、uh, based on your work. And I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about the Chinese fan culture surrounding your work, in particular, Three Body Problem, and how do you, how does that inter, how does that impact you? Does it affect your writing? Are you As it somehow come into your field of vision,、uh, because you know that there's this community out there. Uh, well, 接下来第二第呃下一个问题就是关于我我相信中国很多作家也有非常多的粉丝，比如说金金庸啊、张爱玲等等。但我觉得都不如你啊，<笑>你你嗯，呃，我这张爱玲我不知道，和金庸我是绝对没有办法比的。就是说，<笑>呃。呃，任何一个中国男人，你要跟他说他没有看过金庸的书，那好像是一件很不可思议的事情。这个和他是完全没有办法比的啊。We should say I don't know about、uh, Eileen Chang, but in terms of Jin Yong, I have, there's no way that I can compare to him and his fan base.、Uh, if you grab any male any male Chinese reader,、uh, it's in China. It's basically impossible that they would not have read Jin Yong,、um, and I haven't got to that level yet, so I'm not. I can't compare with him. 但是有一点不一样的是，您的粉丝还会自己去写小说，而且会把您所创造的宇宙又又扩大了，像宝树啊，好多这样的作家就是借着写您的，就是跟着跟着写您那个科幻，把把您所创造的科幻世界又扩大了。我觉得这是非常。非常少的一个一个文学现象。那我就很好奇，您是如何看待就是《三体》的整个网络的这么多粉丝，这么多呃粉丝群呢、啊？有人还打扮成那个小说里里头的主人公啊，呃，就是而且你还会跟他们有什么样的一个互动？而且他们的存在又会影响到您的您的写作，或者您对文学的思考。<咳>首先吧，我觉得这个像这种现象在全世界都有出现
呃，当然不是针对我的作品啊，就是全世界它有一个亚一个文化亚文化群体，一个群众群体，就是科幻迷群体，呃，在各个国家都有，特别是在美国呀、啊、西方啊这种群体，它就规模就更大了。而中国的科幻迷群体其实是很晚才出现的，呃，但是确实表现出了这种呃更大的热情。比如说我自己吧，我可能是中国的第一代科幻迷吧，呃，后来现在这个科幻迷群体在中国已经数量比较大了，呃，他们对于这个呃，就是说能够和他们引起共鸣的这个科幻作品，呃，他们的热情确实是十分高涨的。Um, first of all, I think this is a phenomenon that's showing up all around the world. Uh, that science fiction fans are becoming very, very enthusiastic about their writers, about their works that are participating to this level. Uh, this is something that you do see in America and other Western countries. So I don't think it's, in fact, I think in China, um, this phenomenon of uh, very, very highly enthusiastic Chinese sci-fi fans uh, is sort of, uh, it's appeared later than it has in other, in other countries. Uh, though it's true, they are particularly enthusiastic. Um, I would say that I belong to the first generation of Chinese science fiction fans that ever existed. Uh, and of course, you know, from that beginning till now, they're they've proliferated, and and yes, they really are very very enthusiastic about the writing. 呃，这些科幻迷他有一个共同的这个呃特点，或者说共同的这种呃精神上的特征吧，就是说，呃，他更多的把人类看作一个整体，把自己看作是人类的一员，而不仅仅是一个中国的一个读者。呃，他很关心人类作为一个整体在宇宙中的命运，而不仅仅是在地球上的命运。呃，他们也更，他们也试图通过这个呃阅读科幻小说，通过科幻的想象力来冲破自己每天那种狭窄的生活，呃，试图接触到更广阔的时间和空间。呃，我想这个就是科幻迷的共同特点。而《三体》这本书呢，呃，它的所描写的内容，它的这个题材也恰恰符合了他们的这些特点，所以比较容易引起他们的共鸣。So I think these science fiction fans,、uh, they have something in common. There's sort of a, a an attitude or a way of thinking that they have in common, which is that they tend to see humanity as a whole. They tend to treat all of human all of humanity As a whole, and to see themselves as just a single unit within that whole. So not just I am a Chinese, or I am you know from whatever country,、uh, but that I am a member of this entire human race, and I am interested in the fate of this human race as a whole, and and what we're going to do. Not only how we are going to live on this planet, but how this planet is going to exist in the universe. And they read science fiction,、um, and they 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 appreciate the ima imagination of science fiction because it gives them a way of broadening their world. A breaking out of whatever narrow experience、uh, belongs to them, and sort of participating in a larger world, and I think that、uh, the three body problem, in particular, the the topics, the plot,、um, everything I read about in the book,、um, really speaks to that common way of thinking. It it, it fits with this attitude、uh, that the that is common to many science fiction writers, and so the book was popular with them. Thank you. So today, our our main. Uh, chore of the day is to talk about your new book,、uh, short story collection, *The Wandering Earth*. We also have the U.S. edition up here, and、mm -hmm. it's a collection of short stories. And I'm wondering if we could pick one of the stories in the collection. You pick, and tell us, take, use it as a kind of, you could be our tour guide and take it, us through your creative process of how the initial idea for the story came about, how did it evolve, what was the writing process like. How did the final story differ from the published version,、uh, from the initial conception? And so I'm hoping we can use one as an example. 就是今天我们被分配的任务就是推广您最新的短篇小说集啊，《流浪地球》英文啊选集吧。那我非常希望您能够选其中的任何一篇，然后带我们去进入您的整个创作过程，就是可以通过任何。其中任何一一个短篇小说告诉我们最初的一个
一个动向，最最最初的一个启发在哪里？然后整个写作过程又是怎样的一个过程？然后最后完成之后，他跟你最初的那个构思有什么差别吧？啊，就是我想，您的读者应该很好奇，您的创作过程是怎样的一个流程？嗯，那我想一想，那我就选那个书名的这个《流浪地球》这一篇吧。呃，《流浪地球》这一篇呢，就是说，呃，当时我呃有这么一个想法，就是说，呃，人们一提到。这个行星有生命的行星，就认为它是一个比较广阔的一个世界，比较大的一个世界，有大地、河流、山川。一提到这个飞船呢，就认为它是一个比较小的一个世界。飞船嘛，大概就是一个飞行器，里面可能住着一群人，一个封闭的空间。但是我觉得从科学幻想的角度来看，不一定。很可能它的一一个飞船的体积可能是相当庞大的，可能大到一个行星的那个体积。呃，这是最初的一个想法。呃，这如果说我说如果这样的话，呃，那么干嘛不能把一个行星就当做一个飞船？这是最初的一个想法。Why don't we choose the title story of the collection then? Uh, and talk a little bit about the wandering Earth. <coughs> I think.、Um, When we think about sort of the universe as a whole, and you know what life might be like in the universe, we tend to think in very, very large terms. There's galaxies, there's stars, there's you know interstellar space. There's all the very, very large spaces, and we tend to think of、uh, when people go in might go into space. We tend to think of them in a spaceship, which is which tends to be small, cramped.、Um, we seem to sort of default to a to a, a spaceship being this very small space. But I thought you know from the point of view of science, that might not be. <laughs> Would end up working.、Um, there's no reason why a spaceship couldn't be much larger.、Um, there's no reason why a spaceship might not need to be much larger. In fact, it could be as large as an entire planet. And then I started to think, well, if it, if it, if a spaceship could be as large as an entire planet, why not have an entire planet be the spaceship?、Um, and that was sort of the very beginning of this of the idea for this story. But then, I first did a flight. 从那个一万米的高空去看地球，我我觉得我这个想法十分的荒唐。这样大的一个星球，我如何能够用用什么用多大的发动机、多大的能量能推动它呢？我觉得这简直一件不可能的事情。嗯、呃，后来进一步的研究也发现，这个地球的结构，从地球的结构上来看，你是不可能，呃呃。呃，推动它的，因为一推动它，它它的整个结构就会内部的岩浆就会溢出来，就会解体。所以说，从当时从这个科学角度，其实基本上是否定了这个想法的。呃、uh, ，later so I had this idea. And later on, as it happened, the first time I was taking a plane, I looked down out of the window of the plane at the Earth and at the size of the Earth, and I. Thought back to my idea about how a, a planet might be a, a spaceship, and it seemed to me completely absurd.、Uh, it seemed just impossible that an entire planet could be used as a spaceship. What kind of an engine, what kind of force would be necessary to move an entire planet to treat it as a as a spaceship?、Uh, and later, I did some research into the into the Earth itself, into the structure of the Earth, and it seemed to me that it, to be an even further impossibility. If you put engines on it. If you pushed it, it would move out of shape. The magma from the inside of the planet would come out the surface. There was just science seemed to be completely、uh, denying the possibility of this idea. But, 但是在以后的时间里面呢，这个想法它就一直吸引着我，一直很难从脑子里把这个把那幅图像，那幅很宏伟的、很也很壮烈、很惨烈的那幅图像，把它从脑子里赶走。所以我最近，呃，最后还是决定，呃，把这个故事写出来。Um, but despite that, in the years that followed, I I couldn't get this idea out of my head,、uh, and I couldn't shake this image of a planet being pushed through the space through space as a spaceship, this magnificent, horrible, terrible, sort of awe-inspiring image of、uh, of the Earth moving. And so I decided, in the end,、um, that I would write the story anyway. 呃，这个故事其实是当时计划中的一个系列小说中的一篇。这个系列小说，呃
一系列的小说都是描写这个当太阳发生灾难性变化的时候，人类如何从这种灭顶之灾，从这个大灭绝中逃生。呃，有各种各样逃生的方法。这我们所说的《流浪地球》，这是其中的一个方法。呃，还有别的方法。呃，比如说我唯一写出来的一篇叫《微纪元》。就是那个逃生的方法，就是把人变变变成细菌那么大的大小，呃，逃过灾难。剩下的计划中的很多的这个逃生的方法，到现在我还没有没有写没有写出来。Uh, this story was originally conceived as one in a series of stories、uh, that I wanted to write, all of which、uh, focused around the idea of the sun undergoing some sort of a disastrous explosion or destruction, or there would be some sort of a disaster involving the sun. And that humanity would have to do something incredible in order to、uh, escape annihilation. So it was the entire human race、uh, coming up with some way of escaping its its own destruction. And so this was one of those stories,、uh, pushing the Earth out to spa- out into space as a spaceship.、Um, another story in this collection,、uh, the Micro Era,、uh, also was part of this original series. And and in there, their their approach was to shrink down humanity to the size of microbes or、uh, bacteria and survive that way. Um, the series originally had、uh, I had a bunch of other ideas for different ways in which humanity might es- escape this destru- destruction of the sun,、uh, several of which I haven't written yet. So, 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 最后才去写这个故事中的人物，这就是我的这样一个顺序。就这样一个创作顺序和这个主流文学的创作顺顺序正好反过来。大部分的现实主义作家、主流文学作家都是先有人物，再有故事，再再有更多的东西。呃，所以这所以说这就是一个科幻迷的思维。嗯，而我的这个作品就有典型的这种科幻迷的特点，科幻迷的这种思维的特点。Um, so you can see sort of the process that I usually take in writing my stories. I start off with some sort of a creative concept or an idea or an image that I find very affecting.、Uh, then I come up with a story to go around that idea, to go around that concept, and only finally do I write the characters、uh, who are going to participate in the story. And so you can sort of see how this is. The reverse of how、uh, typical literary fiction, realist literary fiction, is written. Those authors will often start with a character,、uh, and then come up with a story to for the character to participate in, and then go on from there.、Um, but the way that I write stories, I think, is is very typical of、uh, a science fiction fan, of a science fiction thinker. That's that's sort of the way that we approach ideas. And once you actually started to put your pen to paper and write. Uh, how long is that process for, like,、uh, the Wandering Earth? Is this、uh, was it stop and go, or is it just all come out after you've done the the, the thought work、uh, up front? Uh, 就是一旦你开始动笔写，是写的很快吗？还是断断续续的？是什么样的一个过程？呃，这个因为我是个业余作者，业余作者你。写小说，它有一个特点，特别是写长篇是这样，写短篇也是这样。就说你得先在自己的头脑中把这个小说想好，想好以后，然后抓紧时间，那个大块的时间，赶快把它写出来。呃，你不可能像专业作家那样想到哪儿写到哪儿。你作为业余作者，像我，呃，作为业余作者是没有这个条件的。所以说我写小说的时候，基本上。<laughs> 就把它想好了，然后写的很快，就像打印机打印出来一样。不但是想好大概的轮廓，实际上连细节都想好了。呃，然后就很快的就能会把它写出来的。呃，你比如一部长篇小说，你想的过程可能有几年，但是写出来可能就是两三个月的样子。Um, what you should understand is that I'm I'm a I write in my spare time. I'm not a full time writer,、uh, and so that restrains the way that I'm able to create my fiction, whether novels or short stories. It's pretty much always the same. I need to think of the whole thing in advance. I need to spend time、uh, writing the entire story in my mind, 
And then when it comes time to write, to get the writing done as soon as possible. I don't have the luxury of sitting and, you know, writing a bit of it, looking at it, writing a little more, thinking about it, writing a little more. Um, I need to have everything uh, laid out in my head in advance, even the details of a story. And then when it comes time to write, it's almost like a printer, just printing out something that's already written in my head. Um, and so the, my fiction can often take years to think through, uh, but the writing process itself is usually very fast. So this also brings a particular feature, which is my own work. That is, there are critics who say that fiction is divided into two kinds. One kind is without the beginning, and the other is without the end. These two are very different. 因为，呃，和别的文学题材不同，有结尾的科幻小说和没有结尾的科幻小说，它的写作难度是差别很大的。因为有结尾，它意味着这个逻辑的自洽，意味着它是一个逻辑的闭环，一一一个自洽的一个一个体系；而没有结尾，它它的逻辑上就是开放的。像我这种写小说的方法，先在头脑中想好。然后再去把它写出来。一般他写出来的科幻小说，他都是有有结尾的这种科幻小说。嗯、um, ，So this this also leads to a, a certain characteristic of my fiction. There have been some literary critics who have said that you can you can split science fiction writing into two general categories.、Uh, one category is is fiction that has an ending,、uh, and the other category is fiction that doesn't necessarily have an ending. Uh, and the level of difficulty for a writer to write these two different kinds of stories is is entirely different.、Uh, fiction that has an ending means that the story needs to have a closed circle of logic. It needs to make sense. It needs what, however, it starts is is the way it needs to end. You need to you need to close the circle.、Um, the other kind, the open ended kind, you don't necessarily need to know how to know the end of the meaning. The logic is is open ended.、Um, now, all of my writing is. Is closed. It's the kind with an ending. It's the kind where the end, where it comes around full circle again.、Uh, and this is, this is a lot harder to write. Since we're talking about the Wandering Earth, I think I'd be remiss not to mention the film adaptation.、Uh, we all know that a few years ago, when the film was released, it was it broke all kinds of box office records in the Chinese film industry. It's been distributed by Netflix here. At the same time, Three Body Problems film adaptation has been riddled with delays after delays. It's now currently in production, and also a Netflix series with the producers of Game of Thrones. But I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about your、uh, experience with film adaptation. You were actually a producer on the film version of Wandering Earth, and although the film had eight screenwriters, you were not one of them. And I'm wondering. Uh, if you could just talk a little bit about your relationship with adaptation and how you approach adaptation and kind of letting your work go or how much control you have. Uh, because when we 应该相对来讲比较快，而且相当成功了，破了很多中国电影票房的很多记录吧。您也是呃《流浪地球》电影版的监制吧？但是我看有八个编剧没有您的名字，你们好像没有参加这个编剧团队，能不能谈谈整个在改编的过程当中，您其中有没有扮演一个一个角色，或者你们如何看待自己的作品被别人拿过去去改编？因为《流浪地球》电影版确实是跟小说版完全不一样了，就好多细节是完全啊、呃，等于是另外一个版本吧。所以很好奇，听您讲讲讲这个改编的过程。谢谢。呃，改编的过程是呃，首先就是说，对于剧本我参与的不是太多，因为呃，我觉得作为一个作家，你参与到这个编剧的团队中，呃，可能会有很多的麻烦，呃，因为这个作家往往他很固执的，就是认为自己作品都不可改动的。呃，就经常与这个编剧会产生一些争议，呃，所以说，我对剧本的这个改变，我参与的并不多。嗯、um, 
<clears throat> as for adaptation of my own books, it's true that I didn't participate uh, too closely in the writing of the screenplay. Uh, I wasn't part of the, the screenplay, the writing team that produced the screenplay. I think that uh, when a, a writer's fiction is being adapted into film, it's, it's better if the writer maybe maybe not participate that closely because if you have a team of other writers and then there you are, you, you join that team, uh, it can create a lot of trouble for the other writers on the, on the screenplay writing team. Um, the writer himself is often going to be stubborn about details, uh, unwilling to change parts of the story or the characters. And I think it's, it's really easy to, uh, to lead to conflict. 呃，但是我对于这个电影的嗯制作方，我反复强调，我说小说和电影它是完全不同的两种这个艺术形式。呃，你一部成功的这个改编的小说改编的电影，你必须去改它，必须进行大量的改动，对小说以适合这个电影的表现方式。如果你照着原来小说的这个故事去拍摄的话，那个很难成功。呃，所以说我我反复表示，我作为一个作者，我并不在意，呃，只要你电影好看，我并不在意做多大的改动。Um, so it was enough to me to participate in the production. I think、um, that given the differences between film and literature, I think any successful adaptation of a book really needs to、uh, any successful adaptation of a book really needs to leave that book behind.、Uh, there needs to be a lot of change in order to create a successful film. If you stick too closely to the book, I think it's highly unlikely that you're going to have a, a film that's really worth watching.、Um, so, I think that I wanted to participate in the production side to, to make sure that we were creating a movie that looked good, that was fun to watch,、uh, but not to make sure that it stuck so closely to my original writing. 呃，这里我顺便提一下我的另外一部被改成电影的小说，叫《乡村教师》。呃，那个改编成的电影也很好看。当时我对导演说：“我说也是说，只要电影能好看，呃，怎么改改多大都行，甚至你把它的名，你你改的只剩下名字都行，只剩下这个小说的题目都行。事实证明，最后改的连题目都没剩下，嗯、呃，题目都改掉了。呃，但是这个电影还是很好看的啊。So I'll, I'll mention another 外星人啊，嗯。” Uh, I'll mention another work of mine that was adapted into a film.、Uh, that was the country school teacher or the rural school teacher.、Uh, <clears throat> and I said to the director there the same thing. I said,、uh, you know, this you can adapt this, change it however you need to change it in order to make、uh, a good film out of this. I mean, if you change everything and only leave the name behind, that would be fine with me as long as it was a good movie. And actually, in the end, they didn't even keep the name.、Uh, they they even changed the name of the film, but it was a great film. So that's. There's another story. What, what, what's the current? I don't know how much you can say, but what's the current、um, state of the three body problem adaptation? I don't know how much you can share with us. 不知道你能分分享多多少，但是啊，三体的改编过程现在在是在哪个阶段了？但是呃，三体的改编现在主要是还是做这个电视剧剧集的改编。呃，剧集它目前这个奈飞，呃，美国奈飞在在在做这个剧本的前期的工作，呃，另外这个国内的电视剧它也在拍摄，也有个《三体》的电视剧在拍摄，呃，预计大概在明年，明年的年底也许呃可以完成吧，就是说，嗯、呃，目前主要改编就这两个。电影方面，目前我还没有得到过什么更多的消息。Um, right now, in terms of the three body problem, the the two adaptations that are underway right now are a TV series in the U.S. I'm not sure who Nai Fei is, unfortunately, but that's the that's who's making that,、uh, and that's in production right now.、Uh, there is also a TV series that's being filmed in China. Filming is going on right now、uh, with that, and they say that that might be done. Uh, as early as the end of next year.、Um, as for a film adaptation of the Three Bodies, I, I don't have any further information about that right now. I'm just. Because, ah, because China itself, for the adaptation of this big production of fiction, it is actually lacking experience. Uh, 
各方面的人才都都缺少。呃、嗯，所以说他只能是现在只是一个开端而已，所以还是还是需要时间的。嗯、um, ，As far as China's film industry goes,、uh, they don't have a whole lot of experience in adapting this kind of very high budget、uh, science fiction film.、Uh, there's not a lot of experience. There's not a lot of the relevant talent or, or relevant skills. So this is still sort of early days for that aspect of filmmaking in China.、Uh, I think it's it's going to go slowly. Thank you. I'm just going to ask、uh, maybe one or two more, and so for our audience, please, if you have questions, type them in the Q and A box, and we'll be、uh, migrating to the audience Q and A very quickly. But I want to ask, you know, the kind of elephant in the room right now is that China-U.S. relations are not in a very good place. They have been in a very awkward state for、uh, the last couple of years, and I'm wondering what role can literature play for for those of us who Want more person-to-person -person,、uh, contact, and what what can、uh, what role can literature play in a time like this? I'd love to hear your thoughts about this. We all know that China-U.S. relations are in a very awkward situation now. Many people think many people see this picture and feel very awkward, but I am curious about how you think that in such a situation, what role can literature play in a time like this? What role can literature play in a time like this? 是否可以提高，就是我们全国之间的一些交流，或者您您觉得，就是人跟人之间的呃这种互动，也许文学有自己可以扮演的一个一个角色吧？对，呃，文学特别是科幻小说，呃。这个科幻小说这个文学题材，它是与别的文学相比，它最能够引起这个不同的国家，呃，不同的文明、不同的文化的读者的这种共鸣。呃，因为在科幻小说中呢，呃，国家和民族文化的区别往往不是那么太重要。在科幻小说中，人类往往都是以一个整体出现的。呃，科幻小说中的角色所面对的危机，也是全人类所共同面对的危机。所以说，我认为，呃，科幻小说，呃，最最有可能建立起这个不同的国家、呃，不同的文化之间的这个人的这个沟通的桥梁。Has a has a role to play here, and sci-fi is different from other literature in that it is much less dependent on common cultures, common languages, common nations, and common history.、Um, it's a it's a form of literature that is that more easily than any other form of literature, it's able to cross those boundaries, national boundaries and language boundaries,、um, and in part that's because it tends to take humanity as a whole. It tends to see the human race as a as a whole. And to see the crises that face us、um, as as facing us as a whole, rather than just, you know, splitting up splitting up humanity into into nations, languages, and cultures.、Uh, so I think that sci-fi has a real potential to create、uh, channels for for real communication between different nations. 呃，至于中美之间的关系，它出现今天的这样一个状况，我认为很大的一个原因是，可能是一个零和游戏的这么一个。呃，规则就是有限的地球资源，呃，和这个无限的呃和这个各个大国之间发展的这么一个矛盾，呃，这种情况下，科幻小说它能够提供一个很有趣的一个启示吧。So I think that we've we've arrived at the global state of affairs that we're in right now, in part because.、Um, People think of national power as being a zero-sum game of, of political power and of resources,、um, and I think that science fiction has the potential to give us a very interesting, different perspective on on that kind of relationship. 嗯，曾经有一位中国领导人说过，就是说，呃，中美之间，我们有着大量的共同利益，应该和谐的发展，呃，才是一个。很好的发展道路，他说过这么一句话：说太平洋足够大，能够放得下中国和美国
。其实我们现在从科幻小说的角度，我们进一步来看呢，假如太平洋真的不够大，也放不下，不能同时放下中国和美国的话，那太阳系是足够大的，能够放下，完全能放下中国和美国。呃，太阳系中的资源，如果我们都利用起来，可以养活十万个地球。这样的话。中美之间的这个就不是一个零和游戏了，我们有着更广阔的这个呃资源，更广阔的未来，这是科幻小说给予我们的启示。呃、uh, ，Chinese leader once said that、um, China and America had every reason to be able to、uh, coexist and to develop in harmony with each other, uh, uh, to to co-develop. And he said that the Pacific Ocean is big enough for both a China and an America. There's enough room for both of us.、Uh, and as time, as things have developed and and the economy has gone on, we can see that perhaps that's not true. Perhaps the Pacific Ocean is not big enough for both the U.S.、Uh, and China. But if the Pacific Ocean isn't big enough,、uh, the solar system surely is large enough、uh, for both America and the and the United States.、Uh, there are enough. There's enough space. There's enough resources、uh, to support a hundred thousand Earths. In in the solar system, and so you can see you are once again we're not in a, a zero sum game of resources and power. There's enough room for all of us, and I think that's the kind of thinking that science fiction can help us arrive at. Thank you, and maybe I'll I'll end my portion with just、uh, one very general question for the young writers out there who maybe are listening or watching.、Um, Science fiction, or just pure literature. What would your advice be to younger writers、uh, today who are just starting out? Ah, 最后一个问题就是您对年轻作家，您会对他们有什么样的一个建议？不管是科幻小说或者纯文学吧，就是刚开始写作的那一群年轻的作家，您有什么话要送给他们吗？呃，首先就是说。呃，我觉得这个文学创作它不是一个，不是一门技巧，不是一门能够逐步学习就能学会的技巧。它每个人有每个人的特点，他的这个创作道路，呃，创作的方式和创作的呃特点吧，它是完全不一样的。所以说，我们没有办法有一个统一的这个教材教学去教会大家去。进行文学的创作，我想这也就是大学里面为什么没有创作系，呃，这么一个原因吧。嗯。Um, so the first, first, I think I need to say that、uh, I'd like to say to these writers that writing is not, it's not necessarily a technique. It's not a, it's not a craft. It's, it's something that every writer、uh, develops on their own. Everyone has their own course of creative development. Everyone has their own creative style, writing style. Uh, different characteristics. It's not something that you can just hand somebody a textbook、uh, about, and then they can learn from that.、Uh, it's not something that can be taught in that fashion. I think that's that's one of the reasons that universities here in China very rarely have created writing courses. Uh, I think in literary creation, we should do the should use all our experiences to use them to develop our strengths and weaknesses, and should not use our experiences to cover up our weaknesses. 而且有一点就是说，在文学上，如果你把你的缺点发挥到极致，那就是优点，就是你的优势。So I think that one of the things that we should be focused on is、uh, developing our own strengths, identifying and developing our own strengths, and pushing those as far as we can. Not going back to the things that we're not good at to begin with, and trying to make up for our own lacks.、Um, unless, of course, sometimes you can. You can you can take a lack of, and and push it far enough that it becomes an advantage.、Uh, so there is that as well. Uh, 你比如说，有人会说你的呃文笔不华丽，你的语言太简单。假如你把你这种单调简单的语言你发挥到极致，你就成了海明威的那种电报式的那种小说了。So somebody might say to me, you know, your 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 writing is stylistically not very interesting. It's not.、Uh, it's not beautiful enough, and that's something I could sit down and work on and and push myself. And I may, but I'm you know in the end, all I can do is chase after somebody a style like somebody like Hemingway. 呃，如果非要让我给这个
年轻的作者们一个具体的建议的话，呃，我建议我这个建议与文学无关，与创作无关。我建议他们业余写作，不要专业去写作。呃，因为现在文学整个的文学都处于一种呃衰落的状况，一个叙事文学。呃，现在文学的市场越来越小。呃，一般的这个作家要靠这个写作、靠版税来生活，确实是比较困难的，嗯，会给你造成巨大的压力。If you, if I had to say something、uh, to up and coming writers right now, I think it would be advice unrelated to literature itself.、Um, my advice would be to write in your spare time,、uh, have a different job, don't try to make writing your job. Uh, our society right now is literature in our society.、Uh, its place is shrinking. Its status is dropping.、Uh, the markets are shrinking.、Uh, if you're going to try to actually make a living off of your royalties and your and your book sales,、uh, that's just too much pressure. So don't try to make that your full your full job. Thank you so much.、Uh, before we wrap, I want to bring our host、uh, Dinda Elliot back up, and she has a final question for、uh, Lila Shir. 最后，请丽娜回来再提最后一个问题。<笑>谢谢，谢谢。嗯、um, ，So actually, first I'm here. That's that's an amazing thing you just said, which is that you hope that you know you recommend that writers don't don't write as a full time job. So, and you said that you're only a part time writer. So, is that true? What's your other job, if so?、Um, and then I have another, you know, more serious question, but or a different kind of question. 啊、uh, ，就是您前面说到你是业余作家吧？你真的是业余作家吗？那你的正业是什么？当然好奇。呃，现在不是了，现在可以说是专业的作家。但是我的作品，呃，大部分都是在业余时间写出来的。呃，我成为专业作家以后，反而没有发表过很多的作品。就是说，嗯，啊，演我之前是在一个。火力发电厂工作，嗯，呃、right. ，做工程师，嗯，呃、uh, ，it's that's no longer the case. I'm no longer writing in my spare time. I'm a full-time writer now. Um, but actually, most of my works, most of my published works, were written while I did have a full-time job.、Uh, they were written in my spare time. Uh, and since becoming a professional writer, I haven't actually published all that much.、Uh, I used to be an engineer in a in a power station, power factory, power station. Wow! So, so, uh, including these selected short stories, all are written in the evening time. Every piece that's in this collection, The Wandering Earth, was written written while I still had a full-time job. Wow! So, 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 so
。但同时呢，这种乐观是一种理智的乐观。我认为我们的未来，特别是。我们的技术给我们带来的未来，它在很大的程度上取决于我们的选择。嗯。So first of all,、um, I should say that I'm an optimist. I'm、uh, very optimistic about the future of humanity and the future of technology. But at the same time,、uh, I'd like to think of myself as a, a rational option optimist.、Uh, I think that the exact future that technological de development will lead us to, in large part, has to do with our own choices. 呃，具体到人工智能呢，呃，首先科幻小说中对人工智能的那种担忧，比如说人工智能会发展出这个高于人类的智慧，呃，进而可能呃这个征服人类社会这样的前景，我认为还很遥远。呃，达到这一步，达到这样的强人工智慧，它还面临着许多巨大的技术障碍。我认为在目前来说，我们。在现实中，并不需要担忧这种可能。As for AI in particular,、uh, and the kind of worries that you see expressed in science fiction about the potential of AI to develop out of control, become more intelligent than humanity, to overthrow、uh, the human race, I think all those possibilities are still very, very distant.、Uh, they're very far in the future. There are a number of、uh, very difficult technical challenges that would have to be overcome. Before we would ever have to worry about that kind of thing happening. 呃，我们现在所面临的这个人工智能挑战，就是在现实中面临的人工智能的挑战，呃，主要就是说这个人工智能可能会逐步抢走我们的工作。呃，这是我们所面临的最现实的、马上就要到来的一个挑战。Uh, in terms of real challenges that AI may present to us. In our societies right now,、uh, I think that something we should be paying attention to is the possibility that AI will gradually、uh, take over our jobs,、uh, that will result in in unemployment. I think this is something that we that we could be facing in the very near future, and something that we should be thinking about. 以前我们总是天真的认为，人工智能可能首先代替的是那些简单工作、简单劳动，像我们那种需要经过这个高等教育的。呃，复杂的一些的，需要一定的智力的这样的劳动工作是不容易被代替的。但是现在看来，事实恰恰相反。So in the beginning, we sort of rather naively assumed that artificial intelligence would start by taking over、uh, unskilled labor, the the simpler jobs,、uh, and we always sort of felt like. Those of us who've gone through higher education, workers at the mine, cultural workers, our jobs were safe.、Uh, the, uh, but I think that if we look at how things are developing right now, it appears to be the, exactly the opposite. 呃，你像现在的这个律师、医生、教师，呃呃，甚至呃一些呃更高级的，像建筑师，呃呃等等这些职业，都是。有可能最先被这个人工智能所代替的。So if you look now, it's it's actually more likely to be professions like lawyer, doctor,、uh, professors, even some some sort of jobs like architect or whatnot, sort of higher level jobs like these.、Uh, these are the professions that seem more more likely to be replaced by artificial intelligence. 倒是一些我们以前认为的比较简单的劳动。呃，像这个，呃，清洁工啊，管子工啊，呃，护理员呐、啊，这些倒不是那么容易被人工智能代替。呃、uh, ，while it, it, in the meantime the the jobs that we did think were going to be taken simple laborers,、uh, simple jobs, cleaners,、uh, physical laborers, nurses, things like that, these are jobs that actually don't seem likely to be taken over by、uh, by AI. 呃，但是不管怎么样，我觉得我们可能正在走进那么一个时代，就是说，呃，人工智能可能会代替我们的大部分工作。呃，而当这样一个时代到来的时候，呃，就像刚才说的，我们，呃，就是说，我们会有怎样的未来，取决于我们的选择。
But no matter exactly uh, how it comes about, uh, we do seem to be going into a new age in which technology, artificial intelligence will be taking over um, many of our jobs. Um, but as I said before, I, I think that the exact future that we end up with depends mostly on the choices that we make now. 呃，就是说，我们到那个时候，我们必须彻底改革我们的社会分配制度。呃，这个确实是一个重大的社会变革。呃，如果做不到这一点的话，那很可能会出现上世纪初那个路德运动那那样一一场混乱，甚至混乱的程度可能比那个还要大。呃，但是如果我们真的能够提供一个新的，呃。社会分配制度的话，我认为，呃，人类就可以进入一个由人工智能开创的一个新时代。Uh, so I think the the main thing that we're going to need to do next is a complete overhaul, a complete reform of our methods of social or social methods of distribution of resources.、Uh, if we're not able to、uh, change the structure of our economies and our and our distribute and our resource distribution,、uh, this could lead to All kinds of social unrest and and you know and violence through ma mass violence.、Uh, as long as we're able to come up with a system like this and successfully transition to new systems of distribution, I think that we we might be able to successfully move into a new age that's that's opened opened up for us by technology. 呃，我认为现在已经看到这方面的努力。你比如。北欧国家一些北欧国家，像芬兰吧，还有还有其他的一些呃欧洲国家，好像德国，都在试进行一种一种社会实验，呃，叫全民收入，呃，具体英语那个词我忘了，呃，就是说法律规定任何一个公民，呃，你都有保证自己最就是呃基本。比较富足的，就是比较体面生活的这么一个收入。这个收入不是慈善，它就是法律规定的一个公民的最基本权利。我想这个就是为这个即将到来的这个人工智能社会，呃，所所所就是所做的一种一种实验，一种努力吧。And you can see some work being done、uh, towards this sort of reform right now. There are some countries, I think, particularly in Scandinavia, maybe. Finland, maybe Germany, that are experimenting with systems like uni、uh, universal basic income for their、uh, for their citizens. Now, this is not it's not a charity for the poor. This is a basic right of of all citizens. And so, I think in in this kind of program, you can see people doing experiments, thinking about how we might、uh, reorder our societies in the face of this coming the coming changes that will be brought to us by AI and technology. 呃，关于这个问题，我再多说两句哈，就是说。假如我们真的实现了那种完美的过渡，呃，过渡到这种呃由机器顺利的接管人类的工作，进入这样，而每个人都有富足的生活这样一个社会，人类可能仍然面临着巨大的挑战，甚至这个挑战甚至比这个我们另一种糟糕的选择，就是出现那个社会混乱，可能更严峻。这个挑战。嗯、um.。But what I, I'd like to say a couple more things on this on this、uh, subject. The first of which is that even if we can make a perfect transition, we can perf make a perfect transition into a new society that's able to make use of the benefits that are brought to us by AI and by by technology, and everyone you know is has uh, uh, is sufficient support, sufficient resources. We're still going to be facing a major challenge, and this may be a challenge that's. Even larger than the one we would have faced had we not made that transition. Well, if we were facing unrest and in, in,、uh, inequality and all that, all those sorts of things, it may be an even larger challenge than that. 假如说我们大部分的人不需要工作就有富足的生活，那么对于整个人类来说，我们的精神寄托是什么？这是我们面临的最大挑战。That challenge is. <coughs> Uh, suppose that a majority of people in a society do not have to work、uh, in order to make a living. They they have their meet their needs met and they have sufficient resources. The question of how the question of how we meet our spiritual needs after our, our material needs are met are met is going to be the next major challenge that、uh, faced by humanity. So I think we should be like the 
不断的向太空、向地球之外去扩张，呃，去开拓我们的新世界，这样我们才能保持人类，呃，在精神上的一种，呃，一种，一种健康的状态，一种一种正常的状态。So I think、uh, we should do we should do what they do in the science fiction novels, which is to continue expanding out、uh, out from the out from the from the Earth into the universe to continue our expansion and our growth. And I think that's the best way to maintain a healthy spiritual attitude and to to I don't know to yeah maintain a healthy spiritual attitude. Leave it there. 刘老师，有几个听众问题，您还有时间回答吗？还是？我有时间，看你们的，我有时间，没问题啊。好，好，那我们再听两个听众问题。So we're gonna, uh, uh, Liu 老师 has graciously agreed to answer a few audience questions. Uh, this one is from Liang Yufu, who writes, "Mr. Liu, it's so wonderful to see you at this event. I have a question about the relationship between scientists." And the future of the world. When reading some of your short stories, I was struck by a sort of cruelty、uh, and pessimism towards scientists' destiny. For example, in *The Wandering Earth* and other stories, scientists and those who believed in science are portrayed as martyrs, even though they saved the world. I'd love to hear more about what you think. This question is about the scientists who play a major role in your stories. In reading your short stories. 我觉得好多科学家最后的命运非常的悲惨，而且有一种悲观主义吧。像《流浪地球》、呃，《地球大炮》、戴上您的眼睛，科学家和相信科学的人最后都变成烈士。虽然拯救了世界，但是他们的命运都很悲惨。能不能谈谈啊、呃、这个问题？呃，其实，在现实中，就是说。呃，推进历史前进的，他其实，呃，有科学家，也有这个从事像政治家呀，呃，做搞经济学家呀这样一些人。呃，而在小说中，其实他可能为了这个讲故事的方便吧，他把这两种人，特别是这个政治家和科学家，他合到一块了。呃，所以说，小说科幻小说中的科学家，很可能他承担了。比这个现实中的科学家更多的使命，呃，而不只不仅仅是进行科学研究，呃，他所承担的这其他的使命，很可能，呃，会给他带来，他可能要承受很大的牺牲，呃，我想这也可能是，至少是我的科幻小说中常常出现这个科学家最后，呃，有着。呃，就是很很悲惨的命运，这么一个原因吧。In reality, I think、uh, there's a wide variety of people pushing social development,、uh, pushing progress, moving things forward. There's scientists, there's politicians, there's economists, there's all sorts of people. Now, of course, in a, in science fiction,、um, it's much more likely that the the scientists are going to play more of that role. That is to say,、um, the The fate that is that in reality is assigned to all sorts of different different roles in science fiction,、uh, in my books in particular, that that tends to end up with the scientists.、Uh, so much more than than in reality, they are the ones pushing forward development.、Um, they are the ones、uh, pushing forward progress. And、uh, this is mostly just in in order to serve the story,、uh, to make the make the writing more interesting. And so it does it does tend to be they do tend to be the ones、uh, with the heaviest fates、uh, and making the biggest sacrifices. 在现实中，这个科学家他只负责他的科学研究，他科学研究出来的这个成科学成果和技术成果，这他的使用对这些成果的使用是由另外一些人来进行的，而不是由科学家本人来进行的。呃，所以说，呃，现实中的科学家的命运，呃，和这个小说中他肯定是不太一样的。Of course, in reality, scientists are mostly just doing research. They conduct their research, they come up with their results, and then those results are then then go on to be used by other people and to affect actual progress or actual change.、Uh, the scientists themselves are not the ones taking their own scientific research results and applying them to reality.、Uh, 
Uh, so that's probably another big difference between science fiction and reality. And this is a question from Tina Liu, who asks, and thank you for asking it bilingually, uh, what do you think will be the next big technological innovation? Uh, uh,这个真的很难预测,因为科技的走向其实是不以人的意志为转移的。他好像就像这个凯文凯利的一本书中说的,他好像有自己的这个生命一样。呃,他的这个科技,科技的走向就是有他的自主性。并不是说我们在
are we just losing a few pounds in the sauna and going back to the real world? So, 最后一个问题是啊， uh, 我先啊、uh, 举一个例子，就是在物色。物色运动那个期间，好多作家像鲁迅，想通过文学改变世界，想拯救中国人，要叫醒中国人，有很多有这种社会的义务吧。我也记得，大概二十二十多年前，我有跟中国导演张元做了一次采访。那个时候，他说看中国电影或者看他自己拍的片子，他觉得不过是去刷那一样，出出汗，出来以后，世界完全一样了，没什么改变了。他比较悲观嘛，那您自己会觉得，通过文学，通过科幻小说，它可以改变世界吗？它可以，尤其现在我们面临那么多这么大的挑战，尤其是环境的环境的啊、呃、危机吧？您觉得，你身为作家，觉得文学可以，就是帮助我们面临？这样的一些大的世界面临的一些大的挑战吧，或者我或者身为作家，你觉得你的义务，或者对未来对世界有什么样的一个义务吧？啊，呃，首先我觉得作家，呃，他首先是要做的是怎么从这个美学的层面去创作一部作品，让这个作品拥有文学的美。呃，拥有他的故事上的震撼力，呃，他必须先做的是这一点，就是或者是拥有他的可读性，呃，能给读者带来享受。呃，文学它不可能在你创作之前就预先去承担起各种各样这个重大的使命。如果那样的话，呃，我们大概很难创作出这种呃优秀的作品。So first of all, I think what writers are engaged in here is an aesthetic project.、Uh, our writing is ultimately an aesthetic,、uh, an aesthetic work.、Um, our job is to use the beauty of our language, or the power of our story, or the the entertaining readability of of the of the works we put together to bring pleasure to the reader.、Um, I think it's it would be very difficult to. Uh, assigned to the author some greater mission to change the world, and I think that if we gave ourselves that mission, we'd have a very hard time reading writing anything that was worth reading. 呃，具体到这个科幻小说本身呢，就是文学它有不同的题材、不同的种类。它这些不同的文学题材呢，它对于现实生活、对于现实的这种反应，呃，也是不同的。So, if you want to talk about science fiction in particular, I think、um, you know different kinds of writing.、Uh, each has its own different kinds of themes. Different genres have different styles, and each each of these different kinds of writing reflects the world in a different way. 科幻小说它是一个用想象力来突破我们这个时空时间空间限制的这么一个文学题材。它更多的面面向的不是现实。而是未来，而是他更多面对的也不是我们生活的空间，而是更遥远的这个地球之外的空间。呃，这是他的一个他的美学的一个基础。呃，所以说，呃，从科幻小说中，呃，我们更多的是去丰富我们对未来的想象，嗯，对地球之外的未知世界的想象。嗯，而不是说用科幻小说来像主主流现实主义文学那样来反映现实。I think that science fiction, in particular,、uh, the nature of science fiction is to to use imagination in order to help us to help our readers break through limits,、um, the limits of our our conceptions of our of our time and our space. It's not a form of literature that looks to our present,、uh, to the space around us. It's a form of literature that looks to the future. It doesn't. It doesn't look to the here and now, but to the, the, the what's to come and、uh, and life outside of our outside of our immediate surroundings, outside of our planets,、uh, outside of our、uh, the world that we know. And that's the basic the basis of its aesthetics.、Uh, it's there to enrich our imagination and to、uh, expand our our conception of what's possible. 
呃，但是不可否认，现在不管是在中国还是在美国，呃，科幻小说确实是有走向现实、反映现实的这个趋势。呃，或者说，就是说，你比如说，呃，现在这个呃，美国的科幻小说，它更多的关注于我们现实中的很多重大的问题，呃，像种族歧视。呃，性别歧视、技术对人类的异化等等的这些问题，而中国的科幻小说也类似。呃，甚至在中国，就是这样的科幻小说有了一个专用的名词，叫科幻现实主义。嗯 ，Of course, you can't deny that.、Um... Whether you're, we're talking about China or the U.S. or other countries, there is a trend in science fiction of moving more towards realism, more towards、uh, examining our present society, our immediate, the immediate problems that our societies are facing now, like racism or sexism, or the alienation of technology. So this is a, a new trend in、um, a new trend in science fiction,、uh, and and I think there's a, a phrase to describe it called perhaps scientific realism, or I'm making that up, but there's. There's a phrase for that. 但很遗憾的是，在科幻文学中，这样的尝试并不成功。当我们把我们在科幻小说中把目光从星空收回到我们的现实中来的时候，呃，在我们把目光由这个看向星辰的目光收到收回到我们自己身上来的时候。我们所得到的就是科幻小说迅速的衰落，世界性的衰落。嗯、um, ，Unfortunately, I don't think that this trend has been terribly successful. I don't consider this. I don't consider this a success. I believe that、uh, science fiction,、um, when it moves its gaze from the stars, from the heavens down to the earth, when we turn our gaze from the stars to our own selves,、uh, all I think that all that does is weaken what science fiction is.、Uh, it, it weakens the genre as a whole. Because the science fiction's core spirit is our imagination, our imagination of the future. If we lose these things, we will be left with nothing. Its core spirit is our imagination, our imagination of the future. If we lose these things, we will be Because the spirit of science fiction has always been to look to the stars, to look to the future, to look at at the world outside of our outside of our Earth,、uh, and if you abandon that, I think you've abandoned the core of the genre as a whole. So, for me, for myself, I, as a science fiction writer, I don't find it interesting to use science fiction to describe the reality of reality. 当然，也可能读者不可避免地从我的作品中解读出这样那样的对现实的这种反应和隐喻，但实际上很可能那不是我的本意。我真正的眼光还是坚持看向那个、看向星空、看向未来的。So myself, as a as a science fiction writer, I'm not really that interested in critiquing society or critiquing reality, critiquing my immediate surroundings. Um, that's just not what I'm interested in. Now, of course, plenty of readers, as they read my works, may may find that、uh, element within my writing, and、um, and it may and they it may be there. But that wasn't my original intention.、Uh, that was not my intent for the writing.、Uh, what I've always wanted to do was to continue continue to look up, to look at the stars, to look to the future,、uh, to look outside of our own Earth. Before I hand it back to Dinda, I just want to personally express my thanks to Lil Usher for sharing all of your time, experience, wisdom with us over the last 90 minutes. 都特别感谢刘老师啊，非常珍惜有这个机会跟您交流，谢谢您。And special thanks to Eric, amazing、uh, interpretation work. We couldn't have done it without you. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Dinda. Thank you, China Institute. Thank you. Wow, I just、uh, I'm 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 almost speechless, and I I just think、um, you know I also want to thank I want to thank all three of you、um, for an amazing conversation, an amazing translation.、Um, Liu Cixin, you are a true philosopher in addition to being a brilliant science fiction writer. I mean, 
I loved when you were talking about science fiction showing us that life is not a zero sum game. I mean, what an amazing, amazing thing. There were so, there were so many gems that came out of this conversation tonight. So thank you. Um, and I wanted to call for the audience. Thank you so much for joining us and for um, listening tonight. I wanted to just call your attention to a couple of programs we're doing soon. Uh, on November 16th, we're going to have two top China watchers, Tony Sage from Harvard and Yashang Huang from MIT in a program called Is Capitalism Done in China? Uh, and then uh, on December 8th, we're going to have the Beijing writer Liang Hong and Ian Johnson, um, an American writer who, who knows China very well, talking about the newly translated um, book, China in One Village, which our translator tonight, Eric, has been involved in and has helped, helped Liang Hong work on that project. So um, that book looks at essentially how the reform era has changed one village. And um, it's going to be a fast. It's actually the first ep, first uh, event of a, it's our, our first time doing what we're calling. There you go. It's we're calling it one read. And it's a series of events. We hope that the community will read the book with us and then uh, join this conversation with Liang Hong and Ian Johnson. And then we'll have a couple of other programs um, after that. So, so please do join in. And finally, I just want to ask you all to become members of China Institute. Um, this, you saw this program tonight was just incredible. Three incredible uh, stars sharing their, their um, skills and insights and wisdom. And we can't do that, these programs without your support as members. So please join as a member. We're, we're very grateful for that. And we hope to see you all again some, sometime soon. Liu Cixin, Michael Berry, Eric Abramson, please come back to our stage soon and often. We're so grateful. Uh, it was just amazing. Thank you. It's just wonderful. Come again soon.